before we get into our discussion, it's important for us to state that the Higher Education Reform Experts of Africa is a European Union funded project. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of our guests and our guests alone. They do not represent or reflect the official policy or position of HIRSA or the member institutions and organizations by whom our guests are employed. Unless otherwise stated, HIRSA does not endorse, approve, recommend or certify any information, view, product, process, service or organization presented or mentioned in the HIRSA podcast. Welcome to Higher Education Reform Experts of Africa or HIRSA podcast, where we will have engaging, stimulating and hopefully worthwhile conversations on issues, themes and concerns in higher education. My name is Kanya Mjali and I am the Media Liaison Officer for Technological Higher Education Network South Africa, or THENSA, which is a coalition of technology-focused institutions mainly based in South Africa. I will be the host of this conversation, but in future we will have a variety of hosts featured on the HIRSA podcast. For those of you who aren't in the know, HIRSA is an Erasmus Plus capacity building project for higher education, which THENSA established in partnership with Aubriel Global Observatory in Spain and the South African Qualifications Authority, or SACWA. As a pilot project, which will take place over three years in Thensa's member institutions, HIRSA seeks to build a network of higher education reform experts in South Africa, modeled on the higher education reform experts in the EU neighborhood. HIRSA strives to strengthen and revitalize teaching and learning strategies in the areas of entrepreneurship of teaching and learning, work integrated learning, competence-based learning, and curriculum development for the fourth industrial revolution. This edition of the HIRSA podcast is part of an ongoing series on our communities of practice in the above mentioned areas. In our previous episode, we interviewed Professor Rolene Brink from the University of Johannesburg and Dr. Henry Jacobs from the Central University of Technology in the Free State, who provided some insight into the implementation of work integrated learning at higher education institutions in South Africa. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen to our discussion with Professor Brink and Dr. Jacobs, you can always find the episode under the Here's a Podcast tab on our website. For this episode, we're focusing on competence-based learning, a unique approach to education that has been gaining steam over the last decade or so. We have the honor of speaking to Professor Makondelele Makatu, an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Venda. In addition to her associate professorship, Professor Mankatsu has served as one of the co-chairs for the South African Young Academy of Science. She was the recipient of the Eurosa Scholarship, which saw her spend a month at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. She was also the tw- one of the 2016 Africa Science Leadership Fellows, as well as a full member of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. Over the years, Professor Makatsu has participated in many academic and community development initiatives, capacity building and mentorship activities. She was a frontline field coordinator for a project implemented by the Institute for Rural Development at the University of Venda, which sought to assess the causes of household vulnerability and food and water insecurity in Limbobo. Her research projects have focused on widows' bereavement and related rituals, siblings of mentally impaired children, and coping with healthcare for people with special needs, amongst other things. Professor Makatsu obtained her doctorate in psychology from the University of Pretoria, a Master's of Arts in Psychology from the University of Benda, a Master's of Science in Health Professions Education from the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands, and a Master's of Social Science in Employee Assistance Program from the University of Pretoria. Professor Makatsu, a warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us on the HESA podcast. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start these conversations off with what might strike you and possibly our audience as a very simple question. And that is, what in your view is competence-based learning? As we are focusing on problem-based learning, I will look at the competency-based learning as a set competencies that we expect students to achieve at the end of the module, at the end of a semester, at the end of a year. 
and then whatever is assessed should be based on those competencies that we preset. So this particular approach isn't new in education, but it appears to have become the topic of conversation in pedagogy over the last couple of years. Why do you think people have shown a growing interest in competence-based learning? Um, it will depend on institutions, what they set as important in their part in relation to the interactions they have with students. So for me, the interest should be based on an understanding of do you know what in competency-based learning is or competency-based teaching is? So if institutions understand, then it will be easy for assessors and teachers or lecturers to do it for the benefit of students. And if students know already what competency-based learning is, then it will be easy. The interaction between students and lecturers or students and assessors or teachers will be much easy and also easy to achieve at the end of the set um, semester or set module. In our Thank conversation you. with Professor Brink and Dr. Jacobs, we discussed the importance of students in this tripartite relationship that forms part of work integrated learning. And it seems to me one of the benefits of competence-based learning is that students take an active role or a more active role in their education. Could you unpack how that works and why competence-based learning prevents students from being passive participants in their education? We will look at the theories that we teach students in class first before we move to work-based learning because when we teach them theory and we place them in different organizations to practice what they learned in class, we will expect them to achieve and to learn much easier when they interact or their hands on in the activities that they are doing in work-based uh, learning. So if students understand, for example, what psychology is and the interaction between the therapist and the clients, when they go out there to the organizations for practice, it becomes much easier for them to interact. So it means it's easy for them to achieve the competencies set as practical work between uh, practice and also theory. How do you assess whether a student has demonstrated a desired learning outcome? Or how do you demonstrate or show that they have achieved a certain competency? I imagine that there isn't a one size fits all approach because every student is unique and different. Could you tell us how you assess whether a student has achieved a competency? In classroom setting, we have what we call group interactions, group discussions, individual assessment and group assessment. So before we engage students on those activities, we make it a point that students understand what they are supposed to do. And also, the moment you engage students, it, it stimulates their interest in learning. But it becomes much difficult and a disaster where a lecturer thinks, I can teach students what they are supposed to do and at the end of the day, I set a question paper, then they answer that question paper. At that moment is the first time I assess my students. But with the interaction that is there between the lecturer and students and amongst the students themselves, it is much easier for a lecturer to see if the student is still behind or the student has achieved the competency set or what this group discussion is supposed to achieve. And when I, I interact with them as a lecturer, it is much easier to see the student who is behind and the student who has achieved what was said to be achieved. And only with students who are behind, the remedial issues comes in because we expect all students to pass at the end of the day. But when they, they pass, it's not only about understanding of the theory, but also an understanding of what was said to be achieved throughout the semester or throughout the, the module. And it will be much difficult for a lecturer to expect students to achieve the expectations that they do not know or to achieve the competencies that they do not know and something that they haven't practiced. That is why we also expect them to do one-on-one -on -one interactions and practices of things that they are going to do at the hospital, for example, or what they're going to do at the organization. In your experience, um, what are some of the hesitations or fears that some lecturers have expressed with regards to using competence-based learning, if any? 
in my environment, we do peer evaluation of which we indicate, it's, it's very clear, it's documented that when you come to my class, this is what you need to observe. This is what we need to, to, to check if the lecturer has achieved. So then it becomes an easy task, but also a difficult task because sometimes lecturers don't want other lecturers to come and observe their teaching. And for that reason, it will be much difficult to achieve what that uh, peer evaluation is supposed to achieve. And sometimes they will act to make it a point that they, the evaluator gets what needs to be to be get at that particular moment. But then for lecturers who are interested, it's much easier because the evaluations, the action or the activity or behavior in class will be a continuous behavior even when the evaluator is not there. I'd like to move on to discussing um, your role in the community of practice for competence-based learning. What experiences, if any, have you had with the community of practice outside of HESA? The community of practice is a new concept. In our environment, we will look at community engagement or community-based learning and problem-based learning. So when I, I tried to look at the community of practice, I found it a bit new for me and something that requires training to understand. But then by looking at what it is on its own, the common uh, interests, common concerns, then I thought if we are doing this for our students, are we doing the right thing in terms of the concept itself? or not the right thing. So this will be a bit challenging to respond it directly because community of practice is, is something new. But looking at the engagement that we have with our students, with each other as, as lecturers, then it should, I would say we are somewhere halfway to understand or to do what community of practice expects from us. In your estimation, what are some of the advantages of using a community of practice to assist in teaching and learning for competence-based learning? I think the advantage is having support system, support uh, supportive network with each other. That would be one of the advantages because you will not be working alone towards your own set goals, but the focus will be on the common uh, concerns and common goals and common interests. And I think another thing uh, community of practice promotes professional development because when you are working with others you learn from them they learn from you there's also a better uh, learning interaction that is all already there because the concept requires that but the other thing is the working towards particular goals if i've not mentioned this one because our concern help us put clearly the goals that we want to achieve in our practicals or in our practice. But for me, it brings another disadvantage. Because if community of practice requires us to work together, we need to ask ourselves how many are we in this activity that we are supposed to do. And when I look at it from the group work angle, I find it bringing some of the disadvantages in relation to the interest. Are we going to push through to reach this particular angle, to reach this particular goal? Are we going to work together? If there is a problem between lecturers themselves and they're supposed to work together, obviously there will be some disadvantages there. And the other thing, people who are passive, when you are working with them, you carry them through, you pull, you pull them, and it becomes much easier for professionals to work that way. Mm. And we need to sustain this particular interest that might take a lot of energy from people who are willing to work, people who are willing to carry these students through to achieve what is said as competencies to be achieved. If they are to work in communities, because we also expect them to work in communities, what they do in hospitals, what they do in, in, in different organizations or in different schools. So these students, we need to make it a point that we put more effort into what they are supposed to do, what they are supposed to achieve. 
But then you find working in a group towards that, there will be those who put more effort and others who limit the effort that they put in the benefit of this particular student. So the community of practice has both advantages and disadvantages, but I think it carries more weight in the advantages than disadvantages, depending on how people commit themselves and show interest in doing what is supposed to be done. And how do you imagine you will overcome some of the, I mean, obviously communication is critical, putting in enough effort is critical, but are there any other ways that you imagine you can overcome some of the difficulties and challenges that come with, with a community of practice? What I do with my co-lecturers, if we are sharing a module and we have the learning outcomes that needs to be achieved at the end and we divide them amongst ourselves, what are you going to teach, what the other person is going to teach. That part, I find it an advantage because when you know you are supposed to teach unit one, two, three, four, and the other person is supposed to teach the other units, it, you know it is your responsibility and your commitment should be based on this that is set for you. And this is the case with the advantages that we have. For me, commitment is very important and knowing what needs to be achieved at the end of a set time and showing interest in that. We need to share challenges that we are experiencing as, as uh, lecturers, as facilitators. Because if we don't share challenges, you might think the burden that you have, no one can carry it through, no one can help you carry it through. But if you share the challenges that you have, the better. Because at the end of the day, we know our interest is on students. The students have to benefit. What I'm doing should benefit the student. And if you know what these disadvantages are, it becomes much easier because you will share with the other person. And by sharing, you know the other person will also share the thought in terms of how I think we can solve this problem if it is there. How we can deal with these challenges if they are there. And how do you foresee your involvement in the community of practice aiding teaching and learning around competence-based learning at your institution? I think I still, in, in t looking at the, as I indicated earlier on, training is very important. When we started with problem-based learning, from a lay person's perspective, it was like, okay, you need to understand that students should learn based on these particular problems in simple terms. But it was more than that. When training was done, we realized we need to have facilitation skills in this particular angle. And we realized it's not as easy as just understanding what it is. It involves the theories around that uh, problem-based uh, learning. So it is the case with the community of practice and also competency-based learning. Somebody needs to understand and practice. We need to have lecturers who allow to act as students and those who want to facilitate those students. And when assessment comes, we need to understand how are we assessing students based on the set competencies that we said students should achieve. But to claim that people understand, people are doing it, it might not be as uh, clever or wise as it should be, because we'll be claiming that people are doing it in their classrooms. That is why I also mentioned peer evaluation. When we evaluate them, we are not intending to punish, but we are saying, we know you are doing it, but it might be a learning curve for somebody who comes to, to uh, evaluate you. But also at the same time, the feedback can be an advantage to you because you learn from it. So for me, I, I think it is important for institutions to first understand what uh, community of practice is and how it relates or how we can relate it with competency-based learning. Right. And just to conclude, um, do you believe it's valuable for South African higher education institutions to tailor their curricula to accommodate competency-based learning? It's very important because when you set, let's say you have, for this particular module, we have five competencies. And these competencies are not known. They are only known to lecturers because they set the module outlines. That is very dangerous for success of our students. So for me, it is important for the institutions 
to understand what competency-based learning is and how to involve it in their day-to-day -day activities with students. Because they know, once students know what they're supposed to achieve at the end of the day, that will be a benefit on their side. And it, the interaction will be much easier. Because the other thing which I see as problematic amongst lecturers is teaching students and later they, they conduct remedial because their students were behind. But when you carry these students through together, it be, you limit remedial activities. That is a plus activity in the, in the side of the lecturers and also the students themselves. Because remedial is meant for students who are lagging behind, not for students who understand what they're supposed to do, who are already ahead of the lecturer. But if lecturers themselves have this particular understanding, have this particular training. So for me, I think the, the life, especially now when we are looking at the, the pandemic, where it is very, very challenging. And we, we saw it last year, how challenging for most of the institutions were. Some of the institutions opened very late, but the competency-based learning, I think, if it is very clear amongst all the institutions, this will limit a lot of challenges that we're experiencing today. Great, thank you so much, um, Professor Makatu, for your time and for speaking to us on the Hilsa podcast.